This episode is brought to you by Michelob Ultra. Michelob Ultra is perfect for more than just the summer heat this year. Because not only is it refreshing and crisp with only 95 calories, but Ultra is also the official beer sponsor of Team USA at the Olympic Games Paris 2024. Celebrate every point, race, and moment with Team USA and Michelob Ultra for the Olympic Games Paris 2024. Stock up on Michelob Ultra and cheer on Team USA. Enjoy responsibly. Copyright 2024 Anheuser-Busch Michelob Ultra Light Beer, St. Louis, Missouri. This episode is brought to you by Indeed. We're driven by the search for better, but when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash MBO. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome to the Philosophy Ames podcast, where we do philosophy the traditional way. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Scalambrino. So grateful you're here. The Philosophy Ames podcast is proudly part of the Evergreen Podcast Network. If you're looking for excellent podcasts, you'll find them on Evergreen. Thank you for supporting and sharing this educational podcast. Any political or religious ideas discussed in this episode are solely for the sake of philosophical education. Everyone is welcome here on the Philosophy Podcast. You know, I got to live as an adult in a world without the internet. Many people alive today never lived in a world without the internet. It seems like there is an aspect of scholarship that people who never lived without the internet either forget about or overlook. Sometimes questions exist for long periods of time with no answer. Some of the solutions to puzzles and problems that just appear after a sequence of keystrokes or by way of virtual telepathy in an augmented reality nowadays, required significant effort in the past to grasp in a coherent way. In fact, humans essentially sacrificed their entire lives in order to solve many of these puzzles and problems. So this idea that somehow we are Neo learning Kung Fu and just need the right images and words flashed before our mind's eye is an illusion we would need a post-human body to be able to simply update its code in such a way. So the mere conveyance of information is insufficient. It is designed to cram for an exam, then forget about it afterward. This is what may, in fact, be at the heart of a phenomenon I see on social media. People will simply post some heuristic or some idea from a philosopher without providing any context at all. Most recently, someone posted Nietzsche's idea of the three metamorphoses of spirit from Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Immediately, a series of responses came in, all amounting to the same retort, who cares? Every once in a while, someone will respond with some version of, Religion is more important than philosophy. And I wonder to myself, what did the person posting Nietzsche's idea of the three metamorphoses of spirit from Thus Spoke Zarathustra expect? Did they hope for admiration or to appear smart? Do they feel as though Nietzsche's idea will be helpful to those who read the post? It's fascinating how context determines so much of the value and meaning of an idea sometimes. For example, when someone comes to me and says that Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra doesn't make any sense to them, that sets a specific kind of context. In that context, I would recite the three metamorphoses of spirit from Thus Spoke Zarathustra 
to help the person understand a pattern that can be used to understand the comments and the drama taking place in Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Notice how, in that context, it wouldn't make any sense for the person to say back to me some version of, who cares, or I know something better. I would go on to point out subtle aspects of Nietzsche's writing that we should notice, just like when reading a platonic dialogue, which character is speaking is important, and the drama taking place when the character speaks thus is also important. I might even go on to state some of the insights that can be gained by using the three metamorphoses of spirit as a heuristic for understanding Nietzsche's philosophy as it is expressed in the middle phase of Nietzsche's philosophical history. Whereas Nietzsche's early phase from 1872 to 1882 runs from the birth of tragedy to the joyful quest, Die Fröhliche Wissenschaft, his middle phase, 1883 to 1887, stretches from Thus Spoke Zarathustra to Toward the Genealogy of Morality. Nietzsche's final phase, of course, runs from The Twilight of the Idols to his posthumous work, The Will to Power, and it, that phase takes place in 1888. So, it is in the middle phase that Nietzsche develops his philosophical ideas of one, the eternal return, two, the Ubermensch or the Superman, three, perspectivism, and four, Amor Fati. This episode is brought to you by Indeed. We're driven by the search for better, but when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash MBO. Terms and conditions apply. Beyond simply a heuristic for understanding Thus Spoke Zarathustra, the three metamorphoses of spirit relate directly to Nietzsche's idea of perspectivism. So now that we understand the context in which we are considering the three metamorphoses of spirit, let's conclude with a discussion. This tripartite division in Nietzsche maps directly onto a tripartite division in Immanuel Kant. And it's very helpful to recognize this. These stages along the way of metamorphosis may be understood developmentally by both Nietzsche and Kant. Kant calls them elements in the fixed character and destiny of man. Here are Kant's exact words from his book titled Religion Within the Limits of Reason Alone. Quote, we may conveniently divide this predisposition with respect to function into three divisions to be considered as elements in the fixed character and destiny of man. The predisposition to animality in man taken as a living being. The predisposition to humanity in man taken as as a living and at the same time a rational being. And lastly, the predisposition to personality in man, taken as a rational and at the same time an accountable being." End quote. Since the style with which Nietzsche presents his ideas in Zarathustra does not make his employment of this structure obvious, the following shows us how to discern the structure's presence. Thus spoke Zarathustra begins with Zarathustra's prologue and is followed by Zarathustra's speeches. The first of the speeches is titled On the Three Metamorphoses of Spirit. So even though Zarathustra's prologue is already operating within the tripartite structure, Nietzsche hasn't revealed the structure to his readers yet. 
In the opening lines of Zarathustra's prologue, we are told that Zarathustra, quote, enjoyed his spirit and his solitude, and did not tire of it. But at last, a change came over his heart, end quote. Because of this change, Zarathustra, quote, must go under, must go down, end quote. There are two insights we can gain here if we keep the tripartite structure in mind. Of course, this is the idea that the three metamorphoses of spirit can be used as a heuristic for getting a deeper understanding of Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. First, the changing of the levels of the tripartite structure that Nietzsche calls metamorphoses of spirit involve changes of the heart. Second, the going down is simultaneously part of Nietzsche's hermit on the mountain narrative for Zarathustra and a descending along the tripartite structure. It also brings to mind ideas of Plato's cave allegory. After the prologue, we find Zarathustra's speeches, the first of which is on the three metamorphoses of spirit. Nietzsche gives the following names to each metamorphosis, respectively, the camel, the lion, and the child. Thus, the camel characterizes the human level in Kant, and the lion and the child refer to two different ways to occupy the highest order of existence. However, it is clear that Nietzsche sees the child as a higher rank than the lion. The child is the Dionysian artist, the Dionysian, the Dionysian artist, and with a nod to Aristotle, the honor-loving lion may also occupy the highest order of existence. Initially, Nietzsche depicts spirit as willing to renounce and be reverent, quote, like a camel, end quote. Nietzsche refers to the camel as a beast of burden. And so when we see the word burden, it may, in fact, signal some kind of relation to the first of the three metamorphoses of spirit. Generally stated, then, what it is that the spirit burdens itself with is the ascetic ideal. Nietzsche explains, like the camel that burdened speeds into the desert, thus the spirit speeds into its desert. Nietzsche refers to this dimension in which the camel's burden leads spirit as, quote, the loneliest desert, end quote. Now, technically, Nietzsche does not have the camel speak an utterance, since he claims the spirit becomes lion before it speaks for itself. However, we discern that the lion actually has two different utterances with which it is associated. There is the utterance of I will before its confrontation with the great dragon and the utterance of the sacred no, which emerges from the confrontation. Hence, especially in the context of his characterization of the camel, it makes sense that the utterance associated with the camel spirit that speeds off into the loneliest desert is, I will. Further, consider the double meaning of the statement, I will. On the one hand, it may mean I will carry the burden and do the works of the law. On the other hand, it may mean I will in the sense that I have my own will. As such, the two meanings would correspond with the camel and the lion, respectively. Further, Nietzsche says of the dragon that it symbolizes all value of all things. After the spirit asserts, I will, through the lion, the dragon responds with, there shall be no more I will. And it is in the face of this confrontation that the lion utters a sacred no. On the one hand, this is the first time Nietzsche describes an utterance of the spirit as sacred, though Nietzsche later characterizes the camel's attitude as a sacred thou shalt. 
On the other hand, Nietzsche explains that the lion's sacred no indicates the spirit's assumption of, quote, the right to create new values, end quote. In more general terms, this may be seen as an awakening from an unquestioning relation to the herd's rules. Nietzsche loves to use this word herd and herd mentality, of course, actually is adopting it from Aristotle. So again, this may be seen as an awakening from an unquestioning relation to the herd's rules regarding existence and an ascension into the highest order of existence. Nietzsche's description of the third, that is the child metamorphosis of spirit, is complicated. First, Nietzsche associated a sacred yes with the spirit as child, as will be discussed later on. On the one hand, the sacred yes is an affirmation of the transcendental dimension, the third level of the tripartite structure, and existence in regard to a higher set of rules than those governing the herd. On the other hand, this affirmation is clearly linked to Nietzsche's notion of amor fati. Second, Nietzsche introduces the child by asking, quote, why must the praying lion still become a child, end quote. He answers, quote, the child is innocence and forgetting, a new beginning, a game, a self-propelled wheel, a first movement, a sacred yes. For the game of creation, my brothers, a sacred yes is needed. The spirit now wills his own will, and he who had been lost to the world now conquers his own world. End quote. So, in a move that very much resembles Plato's Scala Amoris, Nietzsche is describing the ascent to the third level of the tripartite structure in terms of both an individual's heart and the change in worldview that belongs to the higher level. In regard to his final declaration, quote, he who had been lost, end quote, it points to the realization acquired by ascending to the highest level. Namely, upon ascending, one recognizes oneself in terms of the transcendental dimension, and this ascension to the transcendental dimension is a kind of apotheosis. Apotheosis here is not to be understood as a becoming God, rather it is to be understood as a kind of divinization, the glorification into a communion and communication with the divine. In terms of the tripartite structure, this is, of course, a higher community than the dwelling of herd animals. Returning to the beginning of Zarathustra, after Zarathustra decides to go down from his mountain, he immediately meets an old man, quote unquote, whom Nietzsche refers to as a saint. Keeping in mind that the saint is the first person to see Zarathustra after his solitude on the mountaintop, notice how the saint describes Zarathustra. The saint says, quote, Zarathustra has changed. Zarathustra has become a child. Zarathustra is an awakened one. What do you want now among the sleepers? End quote. Unless you wish to say that Nietzsche is incoherent or inconsistent, even though these statements take place in the prologue, that is before Nietzsche gives us his names for the levels of the tripartite structure, Nietzsche is clearly invoking that structure. What advice then does the saint give Zarathustra in regard to the sleepers? The saint advises Zarathustra to, quote, give them nothing, rather take part of their load and help them to bear it. That will be best for them, end quote. Hence, the saint reveals a camel understanding of spirit, and the camel understanding is a herd understanding. The saint sees the herd in terms of either its animality or its humanity, to use the Kantian terms, and thereby the saint understands existence as a burden. How does Zarathustra respond? 
Zarathustra says no. Interestingly, then, this section of the prologue ends with what may be the two most controversial and perhaps most misunderstood claims in all of Nietzsche's writings. And, you know, I don't take this lightly at all. Uh, so, you know, hopefully the mere mention of this is not off-putting. Again, I, I don't take this lightly at all. I, I'm very sincere and serious about it, and I intend to grapple with this publicly at a very deep level, but it will require so much time that it will have to take place in a seminar, not in a podcast. So that is coming. It is already planned. If you want to read about it, I engage it at that level in my book, Full Throttle Heart. It's available on Amazon if you want to, if you want to read about it in lieu of my putting together the seminar. But returning to this podcast, so again, I take these to be the two most misunderstood ideas in Nietzsche's writings. Nietzsche concludes, quote, But when Zarathustra was alone, he spoke thus to his heart. So this is after speaking with the old man as, he, as Zarathustra came down the mountain. So Zarathustra says to his heart, quote, Could it be possible this old saint in the forest has not yet heard anything of this, that God is dead. End quote. So again, I'm going to dedicate an entire seminar to that phrase in Nietzsche, but for now, let me just say that I don't think it means what most people take it to mean. But staying with the topic here on the three metamorphoses of spirit, after speaking thus to his heart, Zarathustra enters into a town and speaks to the people gathered there. We may imagine that they considered this childlike hermit, this mountain wanderer, to be something of a madman. In either case, two lines later in the text, Nietzsche has Zarathustra say, quote, I teach you the Superman, end quote. And that is, of course, Der Übermensch. So, in a later podcast, we will read the teaching of the Superman in the context of the tripartite structure and Zarathustra's position in the narrative. And what I mean by position in the narrative is to what level of the tripartite structure is Zarathustra speaking and why. This, of course, deeply involves perspectivalism and this notion of perspectivism in Nietzsche. And again, the majority of this podcast was inspired by and excerpted out of my book on Nietzsche, Full Throttle Heart. So if you would like to read about this in lieu of my putting together a seminar, feel free to pick up a copy of Full Throttle Heart from Amazon. And if you post questions or comments on my YouTube videos, I will try to answer them as soon as I can. I hope this episode helps you on your philosophical quest. I'll see you in the future. All right. We are posting videos on YouTube and X, selling books on Amazon, and you can see the philosophy themes in puzzle form on Instagram. I appreciate your questions and comments and your support of this open access educational podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Scalambrino, and I'll see you in the next episode. Ever heard of Stoicism? Chances are, if you have, you've heard of Stoicism with a lowercase s and not Stoicism with an uppercase s. Lone wolves, no emotions, antisocial behavior, cold, indifference, all that is Stoicism with a lowercase s. Stoicism with an uppercase s is the ancient Greek philosophy and virtue ethics framework that centers on service to the cosmopolis, to include your family, friends, community, and planet, and the development of a good moral character. My name is Tanner Campbell, and I'm the host of Practical Stoicism, a three times a week podcast teaching Stoic principles and concepts to anyone interested. 
through the exploration of texts and deep dives into various moral topics. You can find Practical Stoicism where you're already listening to podcasts by searching for Practical Stoicism or by going to stoicismpod.com. I invite you to give it a listen today. You just might like it. 